Well, hello, and welcome to the My Wool Mitten podcast. This is my podcast about knitting, spinning, fiber, yarn, but most of all about wool and sheep, farming, aging in place. What else? I guess that's the main thing. So how have you been? I want to start by thanking everyone who replied or responded to my little farm blog that I put out the other day for our podcast anniversary. I heard from a lot of you and I appreciated all of the comments. It, they were all very kind and very sweet and I want you to know that the feeling is mutual. I appreciate each of you. I enjoy the comments and the encouragement and laugh at the funny at the funny things that happen and so I, I just wanted to say thank you for that that I do appreciate it and I can't believe that it's been a year since I started podcasting when I started I my theme my goal was to highlight a year of growing yarn what it takes to go from one month around to the following year the 12 months and so I wasn't always able to document that like I'd wanted to, you know, as we know, life gets in the way, but I do want to keep going, talking about knitting a little bit, talking about the sheep, and really and especially talking more about what it takes to age in place is the catchphrase that a lot of people use right now for whatever your lifestyle is, but especially as farmers, shepherds, just a few of the things that we continue to discover and find out along the way. Things we wish we'd known and done sooner. Things we're trying to change now to enable us to stay here on the farm and in our home and with a few animals. So you guys are along with me for that ride, for that journey. But also it's about knitting, spinning, other knitters, other spinners, other wool producers. So as I said, my I think I said, maybe I didn't. My name is Carrie. The name of our podcast is My Wool Mitten, and that is because we live in the middle of Michigan's Lower Peninsula, which is shaped like a mitten, and we're kind of in the middle. In fact, in the little town right near us, there is a geographic marker that says it is the exact middle of Michigan's Lower Peninsula. I love to knit mittens. I love what mittens represent as far as wool and heart and hands, and so that just is very fitting. I live here with my husband, and are, we're surrounded by family and friends. Uh, things, the farm and the sheep plot gets smaller and smaller all the time, but we do still have it and um, we enjoy it very much. Our flock now consists of about 15 sheep, give or take a few, that number goes up and down. It's just about breeding time here. It's the beginning of November and we put our rams in uh, at deer hunting, the start of deer hunting, which is the 15th of November here in Michigan. So coming up here real soon. One of the features that I hear from most of you about that, or that seems to be the most popular is bucket talk. When I sit down in the barn or in the pasture with you and with the sheep and we have some conversation. And so I have a little of that, a little bucket talk already recorded that I'll try to insert here as we go along. But today starting out for as long as I have to do this, I'm going to talk about knitting. I'm in a different location than what I've, than where I've podcasted from before here in the house. Um, I have podcasted before over in this corner across the way from me. That's in front of the fireplace. I've podcasted quite a few times from over in this corner, and that's where two of the big windows come together. And the sun is in and out today, and it was just too bright to film with the with the windows behind me. So I moved over here. And uh, though we do have some glare on the glasses, it's maybe not too bad. So we're going to give this a try. I am near a register. So if the heat turns on, that may make some noise. The washer is running. We may hear that buzz. And the farm trucks are going up and down the road trying to get crops out in spite of all of the rain. So there will be some other parts added on here, but I thought I would try to get recorded about the knitting that I've been doing and get that get that done and out of the way because we haven't talked about that much lately. So let's get started. 
What I want to talk about, what you've, you might think this is the only thing I've knit, um, and it is something that I focused on quite a bit this year, and that is working with the New Teton yarn from Newton Caroline and working on a sweater that I started, oh, not that long ago. I'm trying to think when it was. Anyway, let me pause here just a minute. Okay, here we are sometime later. You can tell by the difference in the light and, um, you know, just interruptions, I guess. It's late in the afternoon and the sun is coming in really bright and then fading away to nothing. I have a little light on over here. And so hopefully you can see me and hear me all right. Um, what I was starting to talk about was some knitting that I've been doing. And I think we're gonna do things a little bit differently because it's getting late in the day and because of the, the changing background. I'm going to take you over to my work table I'm going to put the, the knitting up over there and I'm going to talk to you about it from there. I'm going to talk about the sweater that's just been finished. I'm going to talk to you briefly about a new cast on. I was going to go into more detail about it today, but I think the podcast is getting long enough that I'll just introduce you to it and then I will um, come back on the next episode and talk about it some more. So I'm going to do those two things about knitting. We're going to have a little break in the middle and have just a short session of bucket talk where I talk to you um, with the sheep or from the pasture for the barn. I'd actually recorded this uh, in October, uh, a little clip that I thought you might be amused by that uh, talks about things that happen with sheep. <laughs> That's what bucket talk is all about. And then um, I think I'll come back after bucket talk back here to this spot and just finish up and tell you a little bit about what's going on, update you on some things around the farm here, as we do quite often. Uh, and it will involve some things for you to think about, whether you're a shepherd or not a shepherd or farmer, uh, whether you're thinking about becoming one uh, or whether you have been in the past or know someone who is. So just something for you to think about. So how does that sound to you? Let's give that a try and get this show on the road and then all wrapped up. So be back in just a minute with some knitting talk. Well, here I am to talk about the details of my sweater, Knit in New Teton, the pre-yarn. I tried to knit, I tried to knit, I tried to talk about this and give you the details sitting down and wearing it, but it's, we're having such funny light that I thought I'll just lay it here on the table and I can talk about it to you. I think that's going to work a little bit better. So here is the finished sweater. I've been calling it the Kara sweater and I don't think that is the right pronunciation. It's C-A-O-R-A, -A. and I'm not sure how to or pronounce the designer's name either. It's a free pattern on Ravelry, and what I'll do is link to it down below or even here within the video at some point, point. and it's on my project page on Ravelry. But this I started on August the 14th, I believe, and finished it on October the 15th. So right about two months there. I've pretty much followed the pattern other than I think some of the sizing. I just went with what worked for me. And it's a it's a really nice pattern. I think it's a really customizable pattern. Um, I just did simple changes like making it uh, half sleeves um, in you know the, the length and then I also brought the neck up farther. It has a fairly wide, almost a boat neck, I think they're called, which I like, but because I knit this at a, quite a loose gauge, it wanted to slip off my shoulders. So I did go back and I picked up, and I, you can almost see that right about here is where I went around and picked up stitches and worked up and then did my neckline. And I think you really see it on the back side where I went through and picked up the stitches. But of course that doesn't show when I'm wearing it. And this is an I-cord edging, which I really like. I considered a, 
uh, crochet, I saw that some people had done that, but I thought this more closely mimicked the garter. And I could have done garter, but I wanted something a little more substantial up here at the top. And you can see a little bit um, that this portion of the plate of the New Tedon yarn, and this is the robin egg color way from collection number one, but so it just happened to be a little bit thicker here than there. But you know, when I'm wearing it, it's not that noticeable. But one thing I really wanted to talk about was my experience with knitting with this. You know, I've heard people talk about knitting with the um, platalope, I think is how you say it, the Icelandic unspun. I have uh, played around with knitting with that. The fiber mill that we use quite often here in mid-Michigan, Zeilinger's, has also sold plates of the, the um, unspun yarn, and I've used that. And people talk about the drift, uh, how, how easily it drifts apart. But I have to tell you that with Knut and Caroline's, I didn't have any trouble with it drifting apart. Now, I am a really loose knitter. Um, I am a, an English style knitter, so I do throw the yarn, but I'm a really loose knitter. And so I didn't have any trouble with it that way. Where I had trouble, and w which you would, is if I gave a little tug like you normally would from your ball of yarn, you know, or so you want to have some of it pulled out and ready to go to knit with, but then you've got a little bit of yarn and if it should catch like on the edge of your chair or something, it will pull apart. But as you've probably heard others say, or you've probably experienced, it's very easy to just work those ends back together. So I had no problem with that. I did find I couldn't knit outside if it was windy because it would blow the, the uh, yarn around and then it would catch on something. It didn't blow it apart, it's just it would blow it and it would catch on something and pull. So that I found extremely easy to work with. Um, it, it just was very, very easy. I used a size 10, US 10 needle for this, uh, which is I think a six millimeter. And I'm gonna pause for just a minute and open this up so that you can see the colors. This of course is garter stitch, but I want to show you what I did with the colors. Doesn't it look like a watercolor? You know, I have to say with Caroline's dye job um, and the, the colors that she uses, and Knut too, now I know that he's doing more of the dyeing, I think they're so subtle and so close to nature that just like you find in nature, colors just work well together. So I knew I wanted Pip's egg to be the focus and that's what the yolk is. And then I moved into elder pear, Olivetti. Let's see, this was the, this was gray that was from the mill before Knut and Caroline bought their own mill. So I had bought some plates um, from when they were first starting out but didn't own the mill themselves. That's what this is. And then this is one of the graphite colors that they, that was part of their collection. So, and I didn't just abruptly change. I did like, you know, one stitch with one color, one stitch with another. I tried to do it, give it a little bit more visual interest and it's probably not showing in this light. But doesn't it look nice together if I do say so myself? One thing I didn't do on the sleeve edging, I kept it in the pip sag when I kind of wish I would have done it in the graphite because that's what I did the neckline and the hem. But part of my thinking was if I ever wanted to go back and add to the sleeve length, I was pretty sure that I wanted it to be the half sleeves. I wore it around for a while before I decided. But if I did find that I wanted to go longer, I thought it would be um, easier to just maybe pick up and go down with another color. Okay, something else that I wanted to mention is in working with the yarn, 
I found it was, I used the wooden needles throughout and I found that I really wanted, the yarn wanted to be cozied up. The stitches wanted to be cozied up on the needles. Even when I got to a larger, like um, this, I didn't do the whole body in this. I did um, on a size or on a 16, 16 or 24 inch length. I can't remember now body wise, but the stitches were happier being kind of crowded. I felt like even though they didn't drift apart, the yarn didn't drift apart, I did find that the stitches, and maybe it's because I am a loose knitter, they easily became distorted, stretched out. And I knew I wasn't going to do very aggressive blocking on this afterwards, so I just tried to keep the stitches happy and close together. And so I used a smaller circumference of wooden needle. I also did not use double pointed needles on this at all, even though that would have been easier on the sleeves when I got to them. Um, I found that gap that you get, you know, the laddering that you get with wooden or with double pointed needles, again, just distorted the stitches. And so for me personally, this was just an easier way to do that. Uh, likewise, I like a split hem on my sweaters and sweatshirts and shirts. So I would normally have knit this, you know, knit it and then split and knit longer in the back. But again, I just thought there would be a stress point here. Not that the yarn would be weak because it's not, it's very strong, but just that it would stretch out just from the, the tension of going across my widest, the widest part of my anatomy. And so I just did um, the garter and didn't go down a needle size, didn't go up a needle size, but you know, my, the garter is just a little bit looser. And so that's what I did there. I think I called this robin egg once. It's Pip's egg, named after their little chicken. So I, as I mentioned, you can see where I picked the stitches up, because this is a top-down sweater. So actually I'd cast on here and gone down, but then this is where I picked up and went up. But from the back side, you can't really tell. I did work short rows, some short rows at the back of the neck. I maybe wouldn't have had to do that because this is such a wide neck, but it does help it to lay a little better. Oh, and also when I picked up to work up on the neck, you know, it, when you're when you cast on at the top and work your way down, you're doing raglan increases. Well, I just mimicked that in decreases going up. I hope that makes sense. I also uh, took a cue from my friend Anna at Fish Trap Creations, Fish Head Creations, not Fish Trap. And she talks about having more stitches on the front of your sweater than on the back. Now in her case, it's for a larger bust. I have a small bust, but a large middle section. And so I kept more stitches, not a lot. I think it was maybe six, but with my gauge that was close to an inch wider in the front. Now, I adore this sweater. It's everything I wanted it to be. It's so lightweight, and yet it's so warm. It's so incredibly warm. Um, and every I've been living in it. I knit it wanting it to be like a sweatshirt that just went over my pajamas, um, my turtlenecks, my barn sweatshirts, um, a t-shirt, and it's done all of those things. And every time I wear it, which is just about every day, my husband comments on it. What a beautiful sweater it is and how much I must love it. So that's a great shout out right there. Um, it's not a flattering sweater on me. And I purposely tried to place my color changes so it wouldn't draw attention to my most unattractive parts my belly and my hips. But even just even trying to do that, it, it still does. It still draws attention. But I wanted this to be a barn and a farm sweater. And so it's all about comfort. The sweater itself is beautiful. On me, it's not flattering. But that's not the sweater pattern and it's not the yarn. That's my physique. And don't worry about telling me I'm okay and that I'm beautiful just the way I am. And like people always say, 
I, I'm I'm fine with the way I look. I'm just stating the fact that um, this would be a great sweater to wear out and about, but it really is not flattering on me. But I love it anyway. I love it to death. I love the pattern. I love the yarn. I love how fast it was. And I'll talk a little bit more in the podcast about uh, some decisions I've come to about what I work with yarn-wise and yarn weight and size wise and needle size. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. But anyway, this was a joy from beginning to end. I I know that if you watch my podcast or follow me on Instagram, you hear me talk about Carolina Canute a lot and that, that will continue going forward because I so believe in what they're doing and how they're doing it and the product that they're producing. So uh, I'm in love with it. This um this tells me, reminds me of a commitment I made to them to support them when they started out. Um, they didn't own the mill when they started, and when I started purchasing from them back in the beginning, it was yarn and fiber produced from another mill that they were um, supporting and selling. So I feel like I have a real history with them with this. So anyway, that's my very happy sweater. Oh, and I didn't put them out. I've been working on and I had a picture on Instagram. I was making some little leaf earrings to go with it and I, I need to take a picture and show you that. Also in the sweater on the side they had just some little buttons and I thought about doing that but I thought mm, be my luck I'll snag them on something. So one last thing that I want to mention about the pre-yarn. It's sold by weight not by yardage. And one of the reasons I, I decided to start with a sweater like this and, and go down and blend the colors was I wanted to be sure I had enough, you know, of a color to make this. Um, I'm a big girl. This is a pretty big sweater. I barely touched any of these plates of yarn. And I should weigh them to see for sure, but I think because I have two of the pips egg, I think I could have gotten most of a sweater just in the pips egg. But now I have a lot left for, like I said, if I do want to go down with the sleeves. And you can see here, I did, um, I took the sleeves out once. I had them, I like a loose sleeve, but I had them too big. So I tore back and then knit um, just on a, a si one size down needle here at the sleeves. So that does show a little bit. If I gave it a little steam, it would take care of it. But anyway, back to, to how much is left. There's a lot left there. And so you may have seen on Instagram my new sweater project, and I'll talk about that a little bit here in the podcast today. And it is combining my own farm yarn with a little bit of color work using the new Teton yarn. So again, um, I feel like a almost like a collaboration between Caroline and Canute and, and Bill's and my farm. So I'm still calling it the Kara sweater, my farm sweater in these glorious colors. And it's just so warm and yet so light. While I'm filming things here on the table, I'm going to just quickly mention my my new cast on. I was going to go into more detail about it on this episode of the podcast, but we're already getting rather long, and so I think I'll just quickly mention it to you and show you a few things. This is a Kate Davies design. Um, I shared it on Instagram, and the pattern is meant to be a cardigan. It's meant to be steaked. It's meant to be knit in fingering weight yarn. And I'm not knitting with fingering weight yarn these days. And so I had my own wool that I wanted to use along with some, some color work with some of the new Tedon. And so I just 
cast on for the sleeves as she has you to do and I figured my gauge and then I plugged in numbers using Elizabeth Zimmerman's percentage system and if you're not familiar with that really you, you should check it out it will give you some confidence in in knitting to a different gauge than what a pattern calls for and so I did this oh sorry about the beat that's the washing machine um, this is the one I did first with the dark color in the middle and then I wasn't sure that I liked it so much it wasn't quite as subtle as I wanted it to be so then I did this one which I don't know if you can even tell that there's a little bit of pip's egg um, is this all about May this is a hand spun Coradale and Angora Bunny that I had done. It's an old spin from a U that we used to have. It's actually my white U, Hannah. It's her mother. Her mother's name was Hannah as well, but she was a silver U. Anyway, and I think I like this better, but I'm just going to go with mismatched sleeves. I'm not changing it, but I would like your opinion for when I get to the yoke. Do you guys have a preference? Do you like the... Um, kind of rusty brown or do you like the subtle pink? I may have to stop and go let the washing machine know that I'm not ignoring it. But real quickly I also wanted to show you color work unblocked and color work blocked and see how it smooths out. And here's a little tip for you. Maybe you guys do this. These are some of my mitten blockers. These are the ones from Patricia P. Fortune at Knitography. And for blocking a sleeve, I like to use the mitten blockers. It just works out really well. So I'm going to be wearing this one around the house for a couple of days to see if it is loose enough for me. I don't like a tight, tight sweater sleeve, so we're going to see. I'll give you the details on what the pattern is down below, but I'll talk more about the pattern itself on the next episode of the podcast. So wish me luck but so hand spun Coradale mill spun Coradale and Finn this is some of the yarn that I showed you in the, if you've been following and watching the episodes uh, in the episode where I talked about when things can go wrong in a mill this came back with all the slubs and over twists and knots and things so I didn't sell this but I am going to knit with it and so I'll talk about the uh, joys and challenges of that as well. And then I did want to do a little color work with New Teton. And so I did just that. All right, that's all I'm going to say about this for this time. Again, Kate Davies with help from Elizabeth Zimmerman. I cast on on November 1st. Happy October morning, friends. I don't guess probably my phone's camera is going to pick up. There are deer walking the fence row here in the corn. But that's not what I'm here to show you today. This is what's going to count as our bucket talk. I don't know if you can tell how lush the pasture is right now. Of course, it's not as nutrient rich as it was earlier in the year. We've got a lot of pasture, but with sheep, there's nearly always got to be one. You see how deep the grass is she's standing in? And on the other side of the fence is the compost pile and weeds. So I'm out here to get her out of the fence. This is one of the Finn Border Lester Cross Quint quads. And I need to mark her ear, I think. This is not the first time that this has been an issue with her. So, she may be finding a new home. Well, I'm stressing her out here, so I better go and rescue her from the fence. But I just thought I'd tap, stop in I really would like to get a podcast up. It's been, my, this month is my podcast anniversary, one year. 
and I have lots of things to share and no time to share them. So anyway, I hope you have a good day. It's sunny here and supposed to be decent weather. Looks like she's been here most of the night. Her flock mates are just inside the barn there. Even the foxtail looks pretty with the dew. So one lamb successfully rescued from the fence. Well, so here I am back again to finish this up. Um, I'm sorry about the glasses on the head, but the glare from the window was just driving me crazy just watching it record, so I might be squinting at you. But anyway, to finish up, uh, what did you think about the bucket talk and about the knitting? I hope you enjoyed those segments. And so to finish up, I just wanted to update you about the last little episode that I put out, the little blog that I put out before this one, and I talked about some issues that we had here on the farm, the flooding in the barn and the hot water heater failure here in the house. And I wanted to let you know that both of those issues are resolved, they're fixed. It took three loads of gravel to the barn and a new water heater, but we got those things done. And just to tell you a little backstory with the barn, the barn floor is gravel in that area. That's part of the, the addition to the old basement barn, which has cement floor in that. But in that lean-to area, it is dirt. And that had been gravel and kind of like a, um, a clay cap, I want to I want to say. We'd driven over it, you know, had the horses in and out over it for years and years. But one of the times that my husband was in the hospital and we had someone helping us with things and, you know, here with equipment and cleaning out the barn, um, the person doing the cleaning at that time just was, got over zealous about cleaning, shall we say, and just kept going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and scooping out more and more and more and digging down further and further, but all in the center. And so until I happened down to the barn and stopped him from doing any more. And so, you know, there was always some knowledge that probably we were going to have to fill that back in. Well, then we had the roof of the lean-to started to leak, or of the addition started to leak, and we had a lot of water gather in there. That didn't help the matter. Um, we did repair the roof. It has a new roof on that addition to the barn. But then we got all of this rain this year, and some of it just ran down the barn hill and into the barn. Uh, I've since dug a trench to kind of funnel that water away. But in the meantime, we had to do something to take care of that water that was standing there. I had the wooden gates that you saw in that, if you watched that blog, was just to keep animals and such out of the middle section until we could get that fixed. And there was a holdup on that because some, for some reason here in this county, there's some project going on and I've talked to several other people. There is no gravel to be had from, you know, your normal resources where you would call to get gravel. We were on a waiting list and it hadn't, you know, it, there was no idea when it could come and we're looking at winter coming and I needed to have that fixed. So I had to pay a little bit more, but we got it from a landscaping place. Uh, we had friends and family help us get that in. And like I said, brought in three loads of crushed concrete and gravel mix and filled that in. It's probably going to need more, but it's doing the job right now. Um, of course, we had to wait for the water to go down. And no, we didn't use a pump. Uh, that was some pretty, you know, there was chaff and hay and manure and everything in there. So no, that was some of it just dissipated. And then the rest was me and a scoop shovel and a wheelbarrow um, getting it out of there. Not a fun job. But anyway, it's fixed right now. 
the water heater was eight years old, so that was just a matter of time before that would be done. And you might laugh at me to know how relieved I was that that was a water heater. Um, I got up, or we got up quite early one morning, and my husband said to me, I hate to break this to you, but we need to check the pump. Something's going on. He'd been awake for a few hours, and he'd been listening to the pump run, kick on and run like every 10 minutes. And we're on well water here at the farm. We have a well. And so my first thought was, did I leave water on the barn? But I hadn't. And I said to him, oh my gosh, you know, we're going to have to check that out, thinking, are we going to have to replace the pump in the well and the expense of that? If any of you have had well work done, you know how expensive that is. So I said, let me wash my face and brush my teeth and have some coffee. I turned on the faucet and I had no hot water. So went down to the basement, opened the basement door, and that was the little video that you saw. I actually took that to show my husband. But it was the hot water heater spraying hot water all over and about two inches of water on the floor, which we have a drain down there, so that was okay. But um, I was almost giddy. I was so relieved that it was a hot water heater and not an issue with the well or with the pump. So it was still an unexpected expense. And that's where I want to talk to you about how this relates to the farm. Um, to pay for that unexpected expense of the gravel and of the water heater and having it installed, uh, I'll be sending some lambs off to new homes here in the next week or so. They're not sheep that I had intended to sell, they're sheep I had intended to keep, but that's part of the reasons that we have sheep and that we still raise lambs. They are part of a working farm and they're part of a pay, or they're something that does bring us income. And so if you're thinking about farming, if you're thinking about becoming a shepherd, if you're planning to do anything other than raise sheep just as pets, sheep are a good livestock to have. They're fairly easy to take care of and the prices on sheep tend to hold pretty well. And so they're going to go and help pay for the expense of those two things. And I'm just awfully glad that I have them to sell. I've told you before, if you've watched us from the beginning, or I've talked about that I'm not a first generation shepherd. Um, my family raised sheep. And I often remember on more than one occasion, my mom or my dad saying how grateful they were that we had the sheep to make a payment on something if we needed to. My dad had a good job. He was an electrician. He had a union job, but sometimes there were unexpected expenses. And you may smile at this, but back in the day, our farm payment, I remember my parents talking about, was $175 a month. And sometimes the sheep made that payment. And so I guess we're continuing in that condition, in that tradition, that I have some sheep that I can sell and that we will sell and that will pay for those two unexpected expenses. So something for you to think about, real life things to think about. It's not just about growing wool for yarn. It's about raising sheep to help you earn a living. And that's what's going to be happening here. So I think I'll wrap this up and I hope to be back sooner rather than later. As winter time comes, my time of year, um, there is a little more time to be in the house and do these kinds of things. And so I hope to be visiting with you again real soon. I hope you'll continue to stay. Thank you for sticking with us. Welcome to new viewers because we have had some new viewers. I hope that you enjoyed the podcast. Thank you for leaving comments here or on Instagram. I share them with my husband. He enjoys hearing about what you guys have to say about what I have to ramble on about. And so uh, any questions, just like I said, feel free to ask uh, to contact us. And please come back again next month or next episode when I record again. Thanks for sticking with me. Talk to you soon.